Sim Active. I am the Senior Workflow Specialist. Uh, my background is in LiDAR and photogrammetry. Um, and today we're going to talk about um, using LiDAR to enhance your photogrammetric workflows. With me I have a guest speaker, uh, Bradley Cruz, who is the UAV Specialist at ISG. Hello everybody. What we're going to learn um, in this session is setting up photogrammetric product project um, and this is a little bit different because we have LiDAR data here. Using uh, PROJ4 string uh, for projection, this project just in this case we need it so uh, we might as well show you guys how to add that in. Importing a LiDAR DEM and an intensity image for use in the project. Using LiDAR as a supplemental control and then finally colorizing those point clouds. So first off I'd like to Introduce Brad. Um, he's with ISG Inc. and um, the company was founded in 1973. They have over 400 professionals working for them now. 11 offices, mostly they're up in the upper Midwest location wise, but they work all over the country. Multidisciplinary services, everything from environmental to survey, engineering, architecture, all of that. And, um, and Brad specifically is well versed in unmanned aerial surveys. So Brad, a little bit, you got any more information about the company, about yourself, a little background? Yep, so um, yeah, like you said, um, we specialize in the un unmanned aerial systems. And um, um, when I first joined the company, we were just kind of only really do it using drones for video and marketing purposes and um, yeah within the past year and a half we went from just you know a couple standard Mavic 2's all the way to the Galaxy in a flight 1080 HL which you see in the picture uh, that I'm holding then we have a Vux One Regal LiDAR system from LiDAR USA yeah we've been really um, we really expand our capabilities a lot in the past past year and a half and yeah we range from it we do provide services uh, that range from LiDAR surveys, ortho photos, videos for marketing photos, uh, just standard aerial photos, so we do thermal inspections, uh, just a wide range of services. So really it's it's quite a big jump to go from you know the DJI based system, the Mavics and so forth to something as, as large as the Galaxy, knowing that the payload underneath it is you know roughly you know a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> How much fun is that? I mean, it, it's fun. I mean, I enjoy my, yeah, I love coming to work every day. But yeah, like when that drone goes up in the air and yeah, it's over, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, it, it, <laughs> it uh, there's a level of anxiety that kind of starts to build up. And you just want to make sure that the, that mission flies as safely as possible and it lands, you know, lands as it's supposed to. So. Yeah. Now, uh, well, one of the things that, that I find interesting is that, you know, it, it's a big leap to go to LIDAR. Um, LiDAR does yeah. have uh, a lot of advantages and it's, it's very helpful, but uh, it, it has its own processing software. Each, each system, Regal, uh, Leica, DJI, whoever it is, uh, whatever system they have, how, how was it getting comfortable with those? Did you have LiDAR experience prior to that from maybe the terrestrial side or? or... Um, yeah, so bas basically I, I start, started getting to the UAV market uh, UAV LiDAR market back in 2016 when I was um, living down in uh, Atlanta, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And um, yeah, we um, for a small surveying company that I used to work to previous prior to ISG. And yeah, we, we just started with um, a, a Velodyne 32 laser scanner. And that's kind of my first kind of jump into the, the LiDAR and UAV LiDAR market. So just taking that jump and not having any previous experience is was terrifying. Um, it was you just don't know what to do and you had it up it was just it was a it was a learning process uh, for sure and that first year was just really trying to a lot of R&D trying to figure out how to best utilize this technology to get the type of data products for our clients so and with that experience down in Georgia I did a brief stint with LiDAR USA and really getting to know their systems in great detail and um, it just came to point where yeah I just, the opportunity at ISG was, was pretty extraordinary and so here I am. That's fantastic I know one of the big differences between photogrammetry and LiDAR is that you know with with photos you can always you can always work your way back through photogrammetry to the to the uh, position of the images and so forth with with LiDAR 
um, it's all about that trajectory. And that trajectory is defined by the quality of the IMU and the survey that's going on um, while you're capturing the data. So obviously with a regal system, we're talking about super high-end IMUs. The, the trajectories are fantastic, which, which leads to excellent results on the ground. Having worked at LiDAR USA, I'm sure that was a huge benefit. Yes, exactly. Yep. And then also, well, with that local company down in Georgia, I really got a lot of experience with TerraSolid, um, which is another yes. kind of add-on software just for LiDAR processing. Uh, I believe they have a few other tools, but um, for my, my focus was just on the, the LiDAR. And sometimes you'd see very slight deviations in the, the strip lines and they with their TerraMatch software, um, we were able to kind of really fine-tune those um, misalignments and correct those. Very good. So look, we'll, we'll move forward here a little bit and we'll talk about uh, Correlator 3D, our product at SimActive, and how we integrate uh, this LiDAR data that's being captured and being brought in to these workflows. So in Correlator 3D, and I know you've worked with it as well, the optimal workflow starts with your, your importation of images and your tie point extraction, your, your measurement of GCPs, uh, then to the bundle adjustment, and then we would typically uh, generate a DSM or a digital terrain model from the data that we've captured. Uh, we may do some editing and then, of course, orthorectification, mosaic creation, and mosaic editing. Now, when we bring LiDAR into the mix and we've got an existing LiDAR data set or we're doing a dual collect or even separate collects, we can supplement this workflow and use the LiDAR data set rather than generating our DSMs with Correlator 3D. And, and we'll jump through a workflow on that here. Um, so let me um, pop out of the, the presentation and we'll get into uh, Correlator 3D. So as I open Correlator 3D, Give us a little information about this project that, that we're going to show here. Um, yes, so this is just a, a small subdivision that was being uh, designed by our, our survey team, our civil civil engineering team. So we have this uh, site here in Mankato, Minnesota, and um, the, basically the main deliverables that were that were necessary was uh, an, a high resolution ortho photo as well as a digital elevation model, so like basically a land XML file, something that we could bring into our civil 3D so our software by Autodesk so that our, our designers can build, build the, uh, the, the survey that they need to provide for the proper agencies. Right. So in this case, the, the LiDAR drone that you guys are using has uh, two cameras on it, correct? Yes. Yeah, and those two cameras, has, uh, I would assume, were designed and, and angled such that they would capture as much of the swath width that the LiDAR unit was capturing. Yeah, so I believe it's a two ADTI uh, 24 megapixel cameras, and they are kind of, they're tilted outwards, straight outward from Nader, about 20 degrees, mm -hmm. and uh, so that allow and they have a 25 milliliter uh, middle, uh, millimeter lens, and it gives us about a 90 degree field of view uh, with those. Yep, and you had mentioned that this project is in Minnesota, um, which brings about a challenge unto itself in that Minnesota has some coordinate systems that are a little bit different than what we're used to seeing. Mm -hmm. Yep, so with the state of Minnesota, pretty much every county has their own coordinate system, mm -hmm. and it just delivers a higher level of accuracy compared to state plane or UTM. Right. And, um, and accuracy is key uh, with our surveys. So uh, yeah, so we stick with the county coordinate system and it provides a little more of a challenge because they have different values for the central meridian, the uh, false ceasing, false posting, all that good stuff. So this, this project, you know, other than just the LIDAR brings a couple of other challenges that I thought I would take advantage of the opportunity to explain some of these things to, uh, to uh, the folks that are online. And um, one, the dual camera system, that's not really a problem. The coordinate system is a bit of a challenge, but um, easily solved. So let's go, we'll go through this process and I'll, I'll highlight where we run into some issues. First off, in Correlated 3D, the user interface is such that everything is performed left to right. If you wanted to go through the entire manual process, you could do it by following these steps. And we'll go ahead and start a project. We'll do a new project. 
we have different versions of our software and they're basically divided up by the megapixels that the sensor has. So our UAV license is for 50 megapixels and below. Our medium format license is for 100 megapixels and below, and then large format goes up from there. And then of course satellite, and we've got other systems here. Uh, so we'll start with the UAV. And we know we have two cameras. So the first thing we're gonna do is look for camera number one, and we'll add the folder that the images are in. So if we look here, I've got two separate sets of image folders that I created. The two that you provided are here, and they have a, a lot of images that we don't need. And that's inherent in a lot of these hybrid LiDAR systems because they start capturing imagery from the ground and they stop capturing imagery when they return to the ground. So as you're ascending and you're descending, you're capturing images that you don't really need in the process. So given the uh, knowledge that every image takes time to process, let's go ahead and wipe out the images that we don't need. An easy way to do that was to go into, say, let me back up a little bit. Let me go into one of the camera files. Um, let's see here. If I look at the original data, say camera one, and we go down to the file that has all the information in it, I think it's this one, uh, we can look and see by elevation where we don't need images because we've got an average altitude here. Once we hit that average altitude, we can just use those images. So I went through and I edited those, which gave me these two image folders. So if we load camera one, all we have to do is select the folder. When we do that, I also know that this was captured uh, in northern easting and it also was in feet. So I'll go ahead and make those changes right now. We're looking for the image information, the basically what would typically in a DJI be the EXIF information. But because we're using data from the IMU, it's been parsed yes. out to match the imagery. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So as we go through here, um, you know, the image name, that's easy to pick off. This field, I'm not sure what it is, but I know it's not the one I want. We have easting, northing, and elevation. Those are the only parameters that are important to us right now. So we'll go ahead and add those. Um, there are, there is a mega kappa fee here, but honestly, um, we don't need to use that in this scenario. So we'll go ahead and add those images. We have, a, again, a projection issue here. So it's not a common projection. I can't just go through and go state plane, add 83, survey fee, you know, anything like that, because it's not there. Um, I also can't go in here and type in an EPSG code because the EPSG code doesn't exist. So we have to find uh, the, the PROJ4 string. Fortunately, you provided me uh, some information and one of the things you provided me was the LAS file. So uh, this is your LAS file, your LiDAR data. And I just, I pulled it into QGIS because that, that's what I happen to have um, here on my desktop. And once I loaded it in, I can go to properties. It tells me what projection it's in. It found the Esri code for that projection. And if I want to use a PROJ4 file, all I have to do is scroll down to the bottom and here it is. So I can grab this, copy it, and go back to Correlated 3D and just place it in here. And now we're gonna be in the right projection. So once we've done that, it's assigned the projection to the imagery. Um, we're gonna select next. The next thing I'm missing in this case is just the focal length, which I believe, Brad, you told me it was 25, right? That's correct. Yep. Um, so we only have to do this uh, once, and typically it'll show up in the database from there on. So we've, we've done one camera. We're going to do exactly the same thing to the second camera. We're going to go here. We're going to add the folder. We're going to change this to feet. We're going to change this to easting northing. We will scroll down and find the text file. We'll go ahead and assign the proper columns, 
Everything looks good. We'll add it. The projection string's already there, so we'll leave that. Uh, we'll hit next. Again, we'll give it that uh, 25 millimeter focal length. And we're looking for a project folder. So this is the folder where Correlated 3D SimActive is going to put all of the data that it's processing. So in this case, we'll call it, uh, I'll just call it test. And it's telling me that the folder's not empty. I can go ahead and replace anything that's in there. That's fine. And select finish. So now it's going to bring up the imagery in roughly the area that we're working in. And it, we have uh, obviously background imagery um, so that we can see we're roughly in the, in the right project area. And we also see the flight line. So we see the flight line, the path that the, that the drone took. And again, um, I, I think the capture was more related to how the LIDAR is set up, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. So you're, it's not typical that you're going to, you know, typical drone project, you might see much tighter flight lines and this and that. And you got to remember, we've got two cameras here, so they're capturing more information. So the first thing we would do, again, as I said, left to right, um, here are all the steps. And the first step would be the AT portion. So what we will do, what we would do is a bundle adjustment. Now, I can see that there's already still some images in here. Uh, that I don't need. So I'm going to say no to the tie points. And I'm going to take you over here. Once I open the AT module, we now have all the steps that we can perform in AT. And the first step is uh, removing and editing flight lines. So I know I don't need these images here. I'm going to go ahead and wipe them out. I'm just going to grab the block and delete them. I'm not deleting them from your folders, I'm only deleting them from the project. So that is now 10 less images that I have to worry about the software processing. I don't need them. Um, once we're done with that, it's gonna tell me that I've changed the flight lines. I'll just select yes. Um, now we're back to you know a handful of images or, or shorter a handful of images. Now I'm gonna go back in and it's gonna ask to do the tie points. So I'll just say, you know, go ahead and do that. We have a standard and exhaustive, but standard's fine. Um, and we'll go ahead and let that process. So um, so this is a, a land development project? Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. A little uh, small subdivision. Okay. And I, I assume that area where I took out those additional photos is where you were launching and landing? Yep. Yep. So what you're going to see here is the software is going to go through a handful of iterations uh, to do a bundle adjustment or a tie point adjustment on, on these images. Um, once we have that, we can go through some additional steps and I'll show you those here in a second. But uh, I mean, Brad, these are pretty standard projects for you. We have a wide um, range of services that we provide at ISG. So um, yeah, for this, for this one is like resident, residential development. I mean, that, that's um, a little more common uh, than some other jobs. We do have some uh, like industry type jobs. Uh, trying to think what else. Or like um, drainage ditches. Uh, there's yeah. just um, just a wide sort of wide range of uh, applications that so, we use the lidar. And so, yeah, I was gonna say. So how much are you employing the lidar um, now that you guys have it in these projects? Is it is it like eighty um, percent of the time? It's uh, it's pretty bit. I mean, we've had our UAV LiDAR system, just we acquired it right after the UAV, um, the UAV Commercial Expo out in Vegas, mm -hmm. and that was uh, end, end of September, and we've, um, we've done 14 jobs uh, since then, so we knew the snow was going to be coming in to, uh, late, late November, uh, early December, so we were, you know, just kind of full-blown acquisition mode, trying to collect as much as we can, and then by the time, yeah, we're done, the snow kind of prevented us from being able to apply. Um, and be able to collect useful data, then we've just been spending the whole winter just processing that data. So when this step is done, um, we'll go into how we import the, the LiDAR data that you have, the existing LiDAR data, and, and use that to our benefit. So once we have this here, this is just saying, hey, I've tied the images together, they're close, we'll do a bundle adjustment to approve on that. But let's go ahead and load some LiDAR data as well. Now that now that we can, we've got it. 
I'm going to step out of this. I'm going to step out of the AT module. And we're going to go to our import tool and we're going to import the LAS file. So uh, one thing that folks should understand is that um, SimActive and Correlator 3D have kind of they've been here since before LiDAR. Um, so we are a DSM uh, or a raster based tool. Um, so when we have a point cloud, for example, this is the LiDAR data set you provided, open it up, we're going to tell it to extract an elevation model. We're also going to tell it to extract a reference ortho, um, which is a, it's a image from the intensity image. So we'll give that a folder. Um, let's see, we'll call it intensity. Have that in there yet? Okay. So we'll call that intensity, and we'll select that folder, and we'll give it a name, intensity. So it's going to produce that, and it's going to bring it in when it creates the DSM. So you'll note right now it's not actually bringing in the lidar; it's converting the lidar into something that's usable within Correlator 3D. We can also bring in that lidar, and I'll show you that here um, as we get farther down the process. I think it's important to note, like you said, Brad, when you're getting like 200 points per square meter, um, yeah, that's that's really dense data. I mean, that's really good to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, open 200, and I, and I believe for most statewide acquisitions, they're kind of in that eight to 12 points per square meter. Oh, yeah, that's, oh, I mean, if they're lucky to get QL1, they might be eight to, I think it's eight to 12. So what we've got here, um, is we have the intensity image from, from the LiDAR data. So uh, here's Brad's truck. Uh, this is where the drone took off. Um, but the great thing about this is, is we can see features in this data set. And knowing that this LiDAR data has already been corrected, it's already been controlled, any feature now in this data set we can use as a control point. So um, let's go back into the AT module and see what we can get out of that. Before I do that though, uh, just real quick, I wanna show you also that it brought in the LiDAR data as an elevation model. Um, so we have that as well and it's pretty dense data, it's good stuff, um, so we have that as well. I'm going to go back to our reference ortho. I'll turn that on. And we'll go back to AT. And we've got our images back here again. Now I want to create GCPs. So if I want to create a GCP, I want to turn off the images so I can see what I'm looking for. Turn off the links. So say I want to create a GCP right in this area here. And we're going to say yes, go ahead, um, adjust the die point residuals. So again, it's going, to another, it's going to run another iteration of the AT so that it'll get it more refined and in the right location. Once that's done, it'll allow us to measure those control points. And this may take a second. You can also see down here we have a 3D view of, of the surface model that that point cloud or the, the import of the point cloud made. So when you were flying the uh, LiDAR system, did you have any, uh, any visitors come out? Um, yeah, believe it or not, we actually had one, uh, the house that we're, we're looking at. Um, yeah, she came out and was just, <laughs> it wasn't really more of a, it wasn't much of a UAV question. It was just a question about the development itself, that which I didn't have the answers to at that time. Um, but yeah, it was kind of curious. It was funny to see uh, we have this very large scale drone and yeah, didn't, didn't seem very interested by that at all. And yeah. Okay, now that we've got imagery up and we can start doing our measurements, we'll go ahead and run through these. I know it's kind of boring to watch, but um, we'll go through them 
And again, I'm just picking items that are visible within the intensity image, which we can then use. Um, the software is gonna pull the horizontal values from the intensity image, and it's gonna pull the vertical value from the DSM that was created um, when we imported, imported the point cloud. So we have one control point. Let's go ahead and add a few more. Uh, we'll put one up here. And here would be a good place. And you can see since we did run that iteration of AT, the uh, images are going to pull right into the area that we would expect them to um, for measurement of these points. We've got plenty of overlap, so we've got plenty of images to choose from. And again, the alignment looks pretty well. And let's get two more, at least, at least two more. In the drive. There. Yep. Get a line. That's the challenge of a live webinar when you, uh, have features to select, you know, you're not you're not able to speed through things. So let's go through these and I'll grab one more. Save. It really is a benefit to use these intensity images if possible. Um, it, you know, it just makes it so easy to pick additional control. Comes in real handy when you're doing like corridor work or things like that where um, you know the LiDAR has been collected and it's controlled through a larger area so you can come back in, um, you know, with, with your drone and capture the same area you know, post LiDAR mission. So uh, you don't necessarily have to have that attached to the same drone. You can always go back and capture it at another time. So we've got uh, four points here. So really what we're using this for is to, is to register the imagery um, in some sense. So we'll go ahead and run the uh, bundle adjustment here. Let me go, make sure I'm out of the uh, GCPs, so we're good there. And, and we'll run the bundle adjustment. Now again, um, in this case, what we want to use is the ground control points. So even if the drone had RTK or PPK, um, that's great, but we don't need it. So we're going to let the software do all of the constraining and um, use the ground control as, as the reference. So here we go, we'll run the process. Okay, in the essence of time, because it'll probably take about 10 minutes to process the, um, the triangulation, we'll go ahead and I've got this saved as another file, so we'll go ahead and pop out of this one and jump into the one that's completed. That way we can uh, keep this webinar moving along. Hang on just a minute while I make the switch. Stop this. And we'll go ahead and open the other one. Open project. Here we go.
Okay, here we are. Now we're into one that's completed and we'll go through all the rest of the steps. So let me get back to AT. Okay, so now we have our quality report and we can dig into that a little bit. A few things you're looking for, but primarily right here, the quality assessment. It is in the excellent range and you can see the average projection error is very low, less than a pixel, and the average number of tie points is 72. So we've got a, a strong solution here. And then when we look at our ground control, uh, we've also got very, very low residuals here. So we're in good shape. Granted, we used you know, four ground control points. As we scroll down, it'll tell us some information about how we did the bundle adjustment, um, unconstrained. It did a calibration, uh, the EO, EO adjustments unconstrained. And then we can see visually what the difference is from when we started to where we finished. And a little bit more information on the adjustments made on the camera. So for example, we can see that um, you know it's made some uh, positional adjustments, which, which is fine. And as we look down at the sensor calibration, Really what you're gonna see here uh, basically is probably that it's adjusted the focal length a little bit, which it did for both the cameras. Going back to my comment as these were technically the same camera, obviously not, because if we look at the adjustment of the focal length, even though they're the same brand camera, they are different cameras with different lenses on them and the software tweaked them just a little bit differently. So we've got those results. And we can scan down and see a little bit more on the control point analysis. Uh, again, we only had four and we used them to register the imagery. So, uh, you know, the Z values, I mean, I'm, I'm a surveyor, photogrammetrist, the Z values, what's important to me, the X, Y is almost always better than you could expect. So our Z values look really good. Of course, we could add more. You know, this is a LiDAR project. We're just bringing in the LiDAR data to do some work with the imagery. I'm happy with that. Brad, do you have any comments on what you're looking for as far as accuracy on a project like this? Yeah, just pretty accurate. Some, somewhere within, you know, let's say, a tenth of a foot or twelve hundredths of a foot. I mean, that's that's kind of the typical accuracy that we're looking at. But yeah, what All I'm right. seeing is, well, yeah. Is now really let's get nice. on to some of the more fun stuff. So uh, we've we've got our quality report. We've got the the ATs done. We're good there. So let's go ahead and hit OK. And then obviously the next steps are or would be uh, if we were doing a traditional workflow would be to use the AT, uh, generate a digital surface model. Uh, convert that to a DTM if we needed to, then move on to the orthorectification and the mosaicing process. But because we have this LiDAR data, we already have a surface. So we don't need to build one uh, photogrammetrically. We've already got it. We've already imported it. It's actually right. If I turn off the reference ortho, it's right there. Um, so we've already got, you know, quite a bit of work done so we can skip or we can move forward and use the existing um, LiDAR based surface. So maybe we want to go ahead and create that uh, DTM. So we'll go ahead and extract the DTM. Current DTMs change, you wanna save it? Yes. Um, we're just gonna give it a name. Um, I'll go ahead and create a folder. Nah, I'll just leave it. Call it dsm.smf. I'll save that. And now we're going to go ahead and produce the DTM. Um, so a couple options here. If we wanted to keep the features that we're going to extract in a separate file, we could do that. Um, which is very handy when you're doing volume comps and things like that. Um, you know, so you can kind of check and see what the software did as far as what it removed and what it didn't. Um, maybe you just want vegetation removed, if you want to bring back in the buildings, um, you could use that file to do that. But for this one, um, land development, we're just going to go ahead and let it create a DTM. And it's running the same algorithms that it would if this were LiDAR, it's just that we only have 
one return versus LiDAR that would have four, eight, or 32, or how many ever you have with your LiDAR system. Um, but it's doing basically the same thing. Um, in this case, where that return is, is at, a, at a height that's different than, say, a surrounding return by a significant amount, it's going to go ahead and scrub that and uh, determine ground beneath it based on the pixels around it. So uh, it works very well. Um, it'll give you a nice uh, DTM surface, which we do have editing tools. So if you, for example, needed to edit that DTM, um, you certainly can do that, and I'll show you that here in a second. So here we go, here's our surface. Uh, obviously, out here in the trees and the vegetation, um, you're not gonna get a, a robust return like you would with LiDAR, because again, it's just, it's just removing the first return. But again, for the purposes of this project, that's not what's important. What's important is the project site, which is right here. Um, again, we do have editing tools. So if we went in here, for example, um, from top to bottom, we have options that if we wanted to go in and edit this surface, we could uh, by selecting an area, for example, and then just running a fill on it, those kind of things. But for this purpose, we'll just, we'll just continue on with what we have. So now we have a DTM and we're going to create the ortho. So it's gonna ask me again to save it. I can just hit the save button um, and it'll do that for us. DTM, SMF. SMF is just a file format that uh, Correlated 3D uses. You can obviously um, export out the TIFF and so forth um, as well. The next step would be to go to the ortho rectification. So I'm gonna go ahead and show that. Um, we're going to leave the, D, uh, the DTM editing module and we'll go straight to ortho rectification. Now I could do it, I could do it uh, manually, uh, certainly, which is you know, the preferred way to do it. Um, but again, we also did have the easy button and I could go that route as well. The benefit of doing it manually is that you can see what the resolution is and you can adjust it. So for example, here it's showing the optimal resolu resolution as 0.045. That's probably overkill. I mean, what are you looking for when, when you're going to process this out, Brad? Yeah, it's about a tenth of a foot is what, really what we're looking yeah, for. Yeah, so I'm always into, into the, the inches and things that make sense. You know, optimal, I would say is, you know, uh, maybe, maybe uh, a quarter foot, so 1.25 or something like that. Yeah, and one thing I want to add too is like it all depends on size too. So say if we have something, you know, a thousand acres, yeah, we're obviously going to have to pump the the resolution up to yeah, what was it fifteen hundred or even to to um to twenty twenty five hundred foot? Yeah, yeah, so, but absolutely. Yeah, for this type of project. Yeah, perfect. actually, for the sake of time, we'll do the same here. Um, we'll do point two five. Um, so this is optimal. You do have a couple options on your output um, to include GeoTIFF. If you want to add compression, you can add compression. Um, you know, the, the settings for the overlap, this actually tells you what your average overlap is in the project. So overall, you had about 67% overlap in the project, which again, um, knowing that this has two cameras, that, that makes sense. Um, so you could do an optimal or maximal here, but honestly, for, for drones, um, we're low enough to the ground. We, we want to use as much overlap as possible. That allows the software later in the mosaicing process to have more imagery to work with. Um, and then the other two things you have an option on is, uh, the other thing is the, the true ortho. So if you think of it this way, if you're working in an urban environment and you've got a lot of tall structures, you want to do a true ortho rectification, which will then take into account the buildings and try to minimize the lean in the orthos. Um, but if you're in a rural environment where you're doing land development, that's, that's completely unnecessary. So uh, we'll go ahead and process this. It shouldn't take very long. Um, but you know, you were talking about file size and, and large projects. Um, you, what, what's the biggest project you've done? Uh, biggest project I've done was um, a drainage, uh, Kind of a drainage project, and that was six thousand six hundred acres, and we completed that with the uh, um, with the Vux One UAV lidar system. We completed that in four days, I believe it was. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of flying. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, we commonly see, you know, again, on the LiDAR side, we don't really calculate it out that much because the software is, or the, the other software processes the LiDAR data, but um, gosh, I just came, I came across an email uh, earlier today. Somebody's processing 12,000 images. <clears throat> so there are some right. big projects out there. Good. Let's go ahead and you can see over here, um, it added all the orthos to the directory tree. Um, but let's go ahead and move on to the next step, which is creating the mosaic. Everything's good here. Um, we're gonna use Nader optimization. Again, we're not in a uh, urban environment, so we don't really have to worry about building lean or anything like that, but you could use this to avoid for example, if you were downtown and you wanted to avoid going through buildings when it created seam lines, you could do that. Um, again, land development, not a problem. We'll just move on. And we'll let this run for, you know, just a minute. Actually, what it does is it does a quick color balance um, and then it goes through the, the mosaicing process. How do you find uh, working with the, with the two offset cameras? Does that seem to be working out pretty well? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, we just got to make sure we keep those. It's, it's kind of trying to find that balance between the LiDAR and the camera system itself. So trying to make sure, yeah, we get the proper amount of data for the yeah, LiDAR and the orthos uh, to justify a, a, a good mission. Most most LiDAR projects, we always collect, yeah, the dual dual camera images. Yeah, yeah I, I was reminiscing back in the early days two years ago that uh, I was capturing data with, uh, with a M600 uh, for the LiDAR, mm -hmm. and I had a P4 flying um, in the same area capturing the imagery so that we can merge the two. Great, now we've got together. a proper so, mosaic. Everything's color balanced across the image. Um, we could go in and do some editing if we wanted to. If we wanted to change the color or anything like that, we could go in here to the Edit Tools and select the block that we're working with. With drones, it's usually just one block. Um, and then we could either look at the seam lines, uh, which we can see right here. Those are all our seam lines and they're color coded. So anything that is green, the software is confident in. Anything that is yellow or red, the software is less confident in. Obviously you're gonna see that in areas where there's not much variation in the images or treat areas, things like that. So everything looks good there. I'm happy with that. Um, we'll leave that alone. And let's go ahead and look at, um, maybe we wanna adjust the, the Tonal balance, we could do that. We could adjust from the center, as you can see, and you're getting a live preview of the adjustments, um, however you wanna do that. Personally, I, that's anybody's preference. So I'll go ahead and cancel that. I'll just leave it as it is, and we'll leave the, uh, scene, the mosaic editing tools. Uh, there is an export button here, which you could do. You could export the mosaic itself, or you could export the seam lines. Uh, both of which we can also do in a later step. So I'll go ahead and get out of that. And then we'll get on to the fun stuff. So now that we have our mosaic, what we want to do is colorize the point cloud. We will load the point cloud, which I've actually already done. And to do that, you would just go add point cloud. And then you would load your original point cloud. It happens to be right here. Um, so we have that point cloud loaded and I can turn it on. We do want to make sure that once we load the point cloud that we do have it selected when we go through the colorization process. Okay. So there's our point cloud and it's colored by height uh, currently. So I'll go ahead and turn on the 3D view again. It looks like it turned off for a second. 3D view is picture in picture. So now you can see we've got the uh, point cloud loaded. And the way we colorize it is to go here uh, up to process and then point cloud colorization. So the two things that have to be turned on to do this is the point cloud that you're working with and the mosaic has to be selected. As you can see, um, we've got four output bands because we do have a near IRR channel capability. Um, we're not using that right now, so we'll go ahead and remove that band. Once we've done that, we can go ahead and process the point cloud. And it really doesn't take very long. And all it's doing is taking 
the, uh, the pixel values from the mosaic and broadcasting them directly down onto the point cloud. And again, you can see it here in the 3D view. So once we have that, we would save that point cloud. And um, I, actually, I actually have it loaded here as well, but we'll go ahead and save it out so you can take a look at it. So we can save it, um, call our colorized LAS. I'll just, I'll make it lazy. Um, I've got one there, but we'll just go ahead and overwrite it. Say yes. What or software do you like to use for viewing point clouds? Just general 3D viewer? Yeah, I mean, um, there's there's Cloud Compare, which is fine. Um, uh, QGIS now imports point clouds, so you can you can open it there. Of course, they have LAS tools built into QGIS, so you can look at it that way. Um, you've got quite a few options. And uh, actually, the one I like to look at is, bear with me, let me find it. The one I like to look at is called Poetry. Have you seen this one? I have not. Poetry is a oh, nice poetry. little. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's like an online. Like a, well, it, it's engineer. online, but you can also use it um, uh, locally. So we'll go ahead and drag and drop the point cloud. Pop it in here. And we'll do a conversion. Start conversion. Yeah, I've just been typically using, I think it's QT Reader. Um, just use that, just drag and drop, and just for viewing 3D purpose, don't really measure or do anything, just to make sure that everything lines up well. Yep. And we have Colorized Point Cloud. Yeah, I think it all came out pretty well. You know, comments from the uh, from the man who's doing the work. Yeah, that's definitely something we like to use, and yeah, it just helps our our designers and um, our CAD operators just to yeah use that as a reference to see if there's anything that was missed um, by the field guys. And yeah, this is just a great tool, and a a product like this, it just it goes a, a long ways. Yeah, I think there's you know, it's great to have a point cloud for the the X Y Z and in the accuracy there and the density that you've got, but once you colorize something. You know, even even unlike classification, once you colorize it, you can really, really bring it down to a human level and people can understand it. And then, um, you know, I mean, let's talk about what's coming with AI, um, with machine learning to teach it, you know, not only, you know, currently it might be looking at the angle of the rooftop to determine it's a roof. Whereas now, you know, depending on where you're at, you could, you could do it by color. So I think there's mm -hmm. some pretty cool things that you can do having that colorized point cloud as well as, um, you know, your general classified point cloud. Well, that's, um, that's it for our webinar and um, we'll be more than happy to get, uh, get some answers to the questions on the side uh, when we get a chance. But uh, I definitely wanted to thank Bradley for being involved, um, providing the data set and sharing the information. Um, super happy to have uh, ISG as a customer and um, any comments, Brad? Um, yeah, this just looks great. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me and always glad to help promote, you know, UAV LiDAR technology and its benefits. And yeah, this is this is just a great product uh, to have and and uh, deliver ortho photos and colorized point clouds in a quickly manner. Very good. Well, again, thanks. And for all you online that are watching the webinar, um, we will also have a, a recorded version of this. We'll share later on if, if you find value in it. Um, let us know. All right, well, um, thanks, and Brad, we'll talk to you again soon.